Hi, my name is Dave. Today we're going to look at an extremely rare, very unusual monster of a telescope. Uh, believe it or not, this telescope only has an aperture of three inches, and yet, as you can see, it towers above me. This is a Fekker from 1946. A uh, beautiful, strange, bizarre, unusual telescope. This telescope is almost all original. Uh, matter of fact, everything here is original, except for this knob, which I had to replicate. It was broken. And the finder up here. The finder is a replica. I attempted to make a replica as, as well as I could to match the, uh, the one in the picture. So, uh, other than that, it's all original. The legs have been repainted. They were uh, badly damaged. I had to do some repairs. I tried to match the paint color as best I could, so this is pretty much the original appearance of the thing. I later added some safety chains to prevent the thing from spreading out and collapsing. The thing weighs a ton, uh, literally over 100 pounds here. Much more uh, like a four or maybe even a five inch telescope in terms of overall size, mass at least of the, of the mount, the weight of the thing. Uh, Let me show you a comparison between this Fekker and a couple of other scopes. Uh, in terms of overall mass, this Fekker is roughly equivalent to this Unitron. This is a four inch Unitron from the same period, 1950s. And about the same amount of lifting is involved here. Uh, it's a longer tube, of course, but this tube is probably just as heavy as the four inch, maybe even heavier. Um, I don't know, it's hard to judge, but I'll tell you, this one's a lot of work to put together. It's much more comparable to this one than to the other one. This is a Tinsley from the same era, also 19, late 1940s, uh, three inch telescope, so it's the same aperture as the Fekker, but it is much lighter. It's pretty, I mean, compared to a modern three inch telescope, this is a monster. But look at this, this is a super monster uh, because it's much more massive than this. This is a much more friendly uh, telescope in order to in order to be able to use this. I had this out last night I was trying to look at something and uh, even I had to stand on my tiptoes looking at Jupiter low on the horizon 10 15 degrees above the horizon because this thing is so darn high it's way up there in the sky. Anyway I thought you would enjoy the comparison. This little deal here is quite unusual never seen one like this. Here's your focuser you have a clamping mechanism uh, on the other side to, to bring this down, tighten it on down. It seems a little unnecessary. Of course, maybe this focuser would have been a lot looser when it was new. Right now, you there's no need for this, really. Check out these little button oiler fittings here. Here's an oiler that I use on my lathe. Four of those guys in there. This is a pain, I'll tell you. The, the telescope weighs a ton, and then trying to match these things up to the socket here, oh man, I'll do a, uh, a time lapse to show you. I did it the other this day. This is, uh, I'm sure, an original eyepiece and original star diagonal. This little deal here is quite unusual, never seen one like this. Here's your focuser. You have a clamping mechanism uh, on the other side to, to bring this down, tighten it on down. It seems a little unnecessary. Of course, maybe this focuser would have been a lot looser when it was new. Right now, you there's no need for this, really. Check out these little button oiler fittings here. Here's an oiler that I use on my lathe. It goes right in there, put a little zip in there. And now you've oiled your, well, <laughs> now you've oiled your telescope? <laughs> this is not something I've ever seen on a telescope before. I see it on a lot of machine tools, but never on a telescope. Very interesting. This is the objective from the Fekker. I have not attempted to clean it. It had some moisture in it when I got it, but, um, it has dried out since. There are some minor residual traces of that, but I don't think I'm going to go to the trouble of cleaning it. 
I wanted to show you something very interesting about this. I'm pretty sure you can see that it's um, the there are spacers in there, but they're not visible. So you're getting pretty much a full three inches clear aperture without the spacers. And back here, you can see that there are spacers there. Uh, it's clear that the objective diameter is actually a bit bigger. Um, 3.1, 3.2 inches, something like that. Well, uh, with a little extra diameter to include room for the spacers. Very interesting. There are four filister head bolts holding this thing, holding the OTA on. This uh, cradle or whatever you want to call it is not removable. That's permanently attached. This is where you're going to remove the telescope, right here. There's four of these little... I can easily... It'll be perfectly safe with three of them or even two of them. Probably even one of them would be enough. Four of those guys in there. This is a pain, I'll tell you. The, the telescope weighs a ton and then trying to match these things up to the socket here Oh man, I'll do a, uh, a time lapse to show you. I did it the other day, it probably took me 15 minutes holding them out, trying to match those holes. Oh, what a pain. Huge chore. And there it is. This telescope was designed by the Fecker Corporation to be used pretty near the equator, within about 20 degrees of the equator. And it's uh, somewhat limited in that respect. As a matter of fact, it was purchased by a geologist named Thomas Wilson, who lived in Caracas, Venezuela, 1946-1947 time frame. And it would have been fully functional with perfect equatorial tracking in that location. His daughter remembers that they took the telescope all over the world as she was growing up and they used it frequently, different locations, Australia, England, uh, Italy. So it was used elsewhere. It would have not, however, had the full functionality of the equatorial tracking in those, lo those locations. I'm up here on a short step ladder to show you something extremely unusual. Now, with that loose, I can use these two screws here to adjust things. I actually want to adjust it to the maximum northern latitude. Let's take this adjusting screw all the way out. There's a little finger down inside there and it engages these two bolts here. It's also limited by the actual size of this housing and as a matter of fact that's as far as it can go. It's also running into a limitation right here. I don't know if you can tell, but that thing is running into this housing. Um, but even without that, the finger down there inside is running into this part of the housing. So this is the maximum northern latitude this is good for, which is about 23, 24, 25 degrees maximum. Um, now, that means that you can't use this at my latitude. 
and that's not doesn't make me happy. I would like to use this telescope in the original form without having to move the equator and uh, use it properly that is. You can use it of course but it won't have the right ascension tracking. Uh, so uh, let me show you the solution. I made this in my shop. This is a uh, small wedge. I made it to look as much like a casting as I could and to match the finish of the Fekker as best I possibly could. Anyway, the idea of this casting is to give me about 30 degrees. This gives me 30 degrees. With an additional 10 degrees on this thing, I'm good. As a matter of fact, that would make this mount then theoretically good for any place in the United States. Maybe 50, 55 degrees, something like that. So, um, let's see if it works. As you can see, this wedge bolts right to the bottom of this. That thing is heavy. My casting is made of aluminum. This is made out of who knows what. Anyway, it's very, very heavy. But now you can see that I'm getting much closer to 40 degrees. So now I should be pretty close to my latitude. I don't know whether Fekker offered these telescopes in different configurations for more northern latitudes. I rather doubt that they would have sold and made a, a wedge like my pseudo casting wedge that I put together. Anyway, um, it's a big mystery. That may be why these telescopes are so very rare. Well, I've installed my nifty wedge, and I've now got this polar line. This is actually aimed north, and I've got my slow motion control here. So, here's an interesting point about this mount. In addition to that major flaw, here's another one. Check it out. If I want to look at something that's coming up over here. That's the east over there. So I'm looking at something. Well, if I get a stepladder, I can look through the eyepiece and watch this thing and track it. It's just beautiful. The machining on this is superb. Tracks beautifully. But suppose I have something that's setting in the west over there. Let's, uh, let's take a look at that. Okay, so there is something setting in the west over there. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, I want to track. Uh oh. Ah, uh, there's a. Oh, all I have to do is move this to the other side. That's the way most normal mounts are made. Unfortunately, this doesn't have a place to attach the slow motion. So I can't use the slow motion. It's impossible. It's physical. Unless your arms are maybe 10 feet long, you cannot use this when something is in the west. What a pain. All the more interesting and all the more bizarre facts about this strange telescope. I hope you've enjoyed having a look at this charming, interesting, quirky, and bizarre Fekker Telescope from the 1940s. Thank you for watching.